And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to jump, Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic, by the way. Um, and I would just want to jump in. I'm Lindsey Graham and from the federal government, here to help you. From the federal government. <laughs> so Senator Graham, as we were walking in, by the way, uh, meets one of my, my daughters, and, and he says to her, shakes her hand, and he says, don't worry, I'm going to eliminate the death tax. Uh, and, she's on and, board. And, that, and, that, and now she's Googling death tax. And once she finds out, she'll be like, that sounds excellent. I'm totally voting. Unfortunately, she voted, she, she, DC primary, I don't think you're going to uh, need, need the DC vote there. I could actually win there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't have to introduce Senator Graham, so I won't. You all know who he is, uh, and you know that he's running for president. Um, and, uh, but let's, let's start, we're gonna move to, uh, we'll move to foreign policy, obviously, and spend the bulk of our time on that, uh, and, and the race as well. But let's start in South Carolina, right. obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and you've had a, your whole state has had a tumultuous couple of weeks. Um, and, and I thought maybe we could start by talking about what is described as your evolution uh, on the Confederate flag issue. Um, I don't want to characterize no, it no, for the, no, I don't want to characterize your evolution. I would want you to characterize your evolution on this issue. Um, it, from what I understand, you were uh, in the kind of let sleeping dogs lie category for a while. The events uh, in Charleston uh, moved you out of that. But why don't you just sort of talk us through for a couple minutes sure. how your thinking developed? Uh, you want a quick history of uh, how this all started? And the Civil not, War, you're going to give well, us a Civil no, uh, War history? That, that actually started in Charleston. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the bottom line is that in 1961, they put the Confederate flag on top of the dome to, com uh, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the, of the war. And the Civil Rights fight was going on. They put the flag up, not believing it would stay up, but nobody ever took it down. And so from 1961 to 62, it flew over the dome of the Capitol. And as modern times progressed, the fight at home back in the 90s was take the Capitol off the dome. Very tough fight. David Beasley was a Republican governor. He led the fight to take it down off the dome, and he got beat. And I think one of the reasons he got beat was because of that. So the bottom line is that we moved the flag to the Confederate War Memorial out in front of the Capitol, and we built an African-American memorial to the 31% of African-Americans who make up the citizenry of South Carolina. And that compromise held for about 15 years. Uh, it worked for us. Most people, not all, but a majority of South Carolinians thought that was a good way to deal with the issue. Then there was Charleston, and I think it's fair to say this. Lindsey Graham's position on the compromise the day before the attack was it works for us. The day after the attack, I understood something had to change. When I went to Charleston and met the families of the victims, game, set, match. When you saw the photos of the young man who did the shooting embracing the, the Confederate battle flag, when you saw how the families of the victims embraced him within 48 hours of him slaughtering their family, they told him at a bond hearing, you've destroyed my life, you've taken my family member from me, but I forgive you and I will pray for you. How am I or anybody else gonna go to that church and say your request to take the flag down is not reasonable? It's become impossible for South Carolina to move forward. Blame me all you would like. Give me zero credit, we'll be fine. This is a case of where the people led the politicians. The flag will come down soon our problems won't be over, but we'll be able to move forward. And there's been an awakening, particularly in the South and maybe the whole country, thinking about who we are and how we should treat each other better. And it started with families who had been devastated, showing the best side of humanity. My hat is off to them. They're the heroes. <clears throat> Ken. What, is the, uh, what does the Confederate battle flag mean to you? Re virtually nothing except when I see a guy with it on his car, it's probably a, a guy that's not going to vote for me. <laughs> uh, is that true? Yeah, yeah, I'm not doing really well with that crowd. But, uh, but the bottom line... Is that person a racist for having that on his car? Here's what I think has become. Some are, oh, most definitely some are. But I think the battle flag for some is just, who are you to tell me what to do? And that's the symbol of individual, I will not be told what to do. 
But the majority view in South Carolina, and I think the whole country, is it represents uh, the hatred of the man who shot the people. And that's why it's coming down. It is his flag. And if you want to fly the flag in your yard, you can. But nobody puts it out in front in their business. That tells you a lot about why they don't do that. So it's a time for South Carolina to change. We are changing. And I hope some good will come of this. I've never seen anything like this in my state. I have cried more in the last 10 days than I have since my parents died. Every church is full in South Carolina. People are talking to each other in a different way. I don't know if it will last, but I hope and pray it does. To me, it needs to be in a museum. You can look at it any way you want to look at it. What? Um, <laughs> there's a line of argument that says that the, the, the flag issue, it's necessary to come down, obviously, but it's also a kind of avoidance. I mean, it doesn't get at structural racism, it doesn't get at continued uh, inequality in schools, it doesn't get at, at systemic right to say segregation. That. So, so the question is, what are you going to do to move those issues, which are not symbolic issues, those are actual real issues? Okay, the next president of the United States, what are they going to do about Baltimore and about the quarter shame in South Carolina? Here's a formula that's been time tested. Bad schools and no jobs equals bad stuff. Okay, it's 2015. Is it about money in public education, the lack thereof? Is it about lack of quality? Here's the problem. There are poor counties in South Carolina, predominantly African American, 13, along the I-95 corridor, where there is no tax base. It's hard to recruit a teacher because the quality of life is pretty difficult. And we're in a death spiral. You got inner city schools that can't produce a quality education. How do you change them? The next president of the United States needs to be able to find a way to change schools who consistently fail their, uh, their, 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 their pupils and the families of, of the students. How do you get parents more involved in their kids' lives? At the end of the day, uh, the flag is a symbol that gives us a chance to start over by saying, we recognize your pain we're going to honor your request. We were wrong to keep it up. You're right to take it down. And that's a pretty good damn place to start. And from that, you can have a conversation about, all right, now here's my challenge to President Obama. What have you done in the last six and a half years to create choice in education where there is none? If you keep throwing money at failing schools, you're going to get the same outcome, apparently. Because there are some school districts where it's not a money problem. I would argue some places in South Carolina it's a money problem because education is funded by the property taxes. Here's the death spiral. Businesses don't go into these counties because it's hard to put your product to the market and housing costs are high in terms of property taxes because the few people who live there get soaked so you really don't have a lot of revenue coming in. There needs to be a statewide system of collecting money to supplement the budgets of these 13 counties. Somehow, when it's a money problem, you gotta find more money. And when it's not a money problem, you better find something else. How many of you think the biggest problem in public education is the lack of money? How many of you think it's something more than just money? Well, let's find out what the hell that something is. Let me, um, let, let's come at, at race and education. And keep around from getting a Negro weapon. The, well, yeah, we're going to get there. Don't worry. <laughs> the, the, the sun has risen, and we're going to get to the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, the, let me go at some of these issues through the prism of um, the presidential race. Right. Now, since the time that we came on this stage, probably eight more Republicans have announced <laughs> they're going to run for, for, for president. Um, so the obvious question... We have three basketball teams and a spare. The, uh, who's the spare? Uh, I think he just got in yesterday. Chris Christie. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. the spare? Bad, no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't take that back. No. It's already out there, yeah. The, no, was it Chris? What? Well, the last oh, guy got in. I think it's... Uh, no, Chris hasn't gotten in yet. Yeah. It's Jindal. Maybe. Jindal, I, don't, I can't. Okay, whatever. Anyway, the point is... If nobody, you could name all our candidates, I'll buy you dinner. I can't name no, them. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody can, <laughs> nobody can do it. Really? I don't but, think there are five but people so this, in America this, this, that can't. But this, so this, this prompts the obvious question, which is why are you running for president? Because we need more people. You need more people? The, run. the presidency only the is one person at a time. The key to winning in 2016 is have 37 people to choose from. You know why I'm running for president? I think I'd be the best commander in chief of anybody running on our side or theirs. Why? Because I know 
from experience the mess we're in and how to get out of it. I've been more right than wrong. Me and John McCain, my buddy John McCain and I have spent a lot of time learning the hard way. I messed up when it came to Iraq. I didn't understand what would happen if you took the Iraqi army down. Now I know President Bush and Rumsfeld were hard to change. John McCain and Lindsey Graham said Rumsfeld needs to go because it's not working. I think I understand exactly the mess we're in. Leaving Iraq too soon was just as bad as not having enough when you went in. At the end of the day, Syria is hell on earth, and there is no way to fix Iraq unless you fix Syria, and you're not going to fix Syria until you deal with Assad, because no air army is going to just fight ISIL, which is our biggest threat. We're not going to give half of Syria to Iran through their proxy called Assad. I spent a lot of time learning this crap, and I am ready to go. <laughs> I am ready to go. Let me uh, and Putin. Let me. Your worst days are ahead, pal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Putin threatened from Aspen Ideas Festival. Yeah, that's is right. the, uh, <laughs> That will certainly have anybody him, riding have, around without a shirt. Is have, not him, that have him quaking in his boots once Putin realizes that Aspen has turned against him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me um, let me deconstruct some of your crap, if okay. you will. Um, <laughs> the. Um, and, and, and let's start, I mean, so you obviously sure. want to move to, to, to foreign affairs, right? I'm going to be... No, I don't care. We'll talk about anything. I'll we'll talk no, about I'll gay marriage. We'll talk I'll, about gay I'll marriage. I'll follow your, you your lead. We've done this before, by the way. I don't know. Um, let's, 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 let's go to this. Um, this morning, I interviewed Ben Rose, the Deputy National Security Advisor on this stage, um, and I, I asked him a, a simple question. Who is more dangerous to the United States right now? Uh, ISIS or the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran? And he, without hesitation, said ISIS. What's your answer to that question? They're a distant second to Iran. Why? They represent a threat. They represent a capability to strike the homeland. But they're not a nation state desirous of nuclear weapons. They'd like a nuclear weapon. But they don't have the destabilizing influence that a nuclear armed Iran would have. If you ask me of all the threats, that keep me up at night is the Iranians with a nuclear capability. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard's doing a pretty good job of uh, destabilizing the region. The Houthis wouldn't last 15 minutes. Assad wouldn't last five minutes without Iranian support. They basically destroyed Iraq. The most effective fighting force in Iraq are Shia militia, controlled by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. The caliphate doesn't represent the threat to the world order as a nuclear-armed Iran, so it's not even close to me. If you don't get Iran right in terms of their nuclear ambitions and controlling their de destabilizing influence, that is far more ominous to us than ISIL, even so though they're really bad. What's, from your perspective, what's wrong with the pending Iranian nuclear deal? Let's go into that for a couple minutes. Oh, other than sitting down talking with people who are nuts, <laughs> as if they're not nuts. <laughs> uh, they're religious Nazis. What, what are they going to do with the money you give them? Do you think they're going to build Obama hospitals says, in school? President, President Obama says that they're on the hook to their people oh, for $100 billion in infrastructure in absolutely. schools. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure the Ayatollah is worried about the next election. <laughs> you know, i got to get better roads here. They're going to kick me out. I don't think so. This whole construct of treating Iran as anything other than a uh, totalitarian religious theocracy is nuts. How many people believe they're moderates in the Iranian government? Well, I couldn't, di uh, we'll have a drink. There are no moderates in the Iranian government. The moderates were killed a long time ago. There are people that present well in the Iranian government. They're going to do what the Ayatollah tells them. They're puppets out front. There are no moderates in this regime. The moderates rose up in 2009 and pretty much got slaughtered. Senator, Senator Graham, let me, let, me, let me focus in on the, on the, on so the nuclear So I wouldn't treat deal. them as if they're something they're not. But can you make, we made nuclear deals with the Soviets who sought worldwide domination right. and had the power to kill all of us. Iran right. has not the power, they don't have the power to kill uh, many of us at all. <laughs> no, they, they, they don't. They simply don't have the capability of killing large numbers of Americans. They could cause havoc in the Middle East, certainly. Well, so, if they so, got a nuclear weapon, what would happen then? But let me ask you this, though. The, the, the deal, Do they want to kill a the, lot of us? The, I don't know. I mean, I, I, at think this moment, they, I, I think they do. The deal, if it works, the deal, if it works, would keep them from the nuclear threshold. If they are as crazy as you say, don't you want to have a system in place to keep them from the nuclear threshold. A good deal is a blessing, a bad deal is a nightmare. Why is, is this a bad it? deal? 
I think any deal is bad that doesn't change their behavior as a requirement to lift inspections. What's the magic of 10 years? Under the current construct, 10 years from now, it doesn't matter what they're doing, the inspections go away. Why would you give them money given the fact that they're destabilizing the region under sanctions? Does anybody believe that the Middle East would be different if it was not for Iranian intervention? Look what they're doing without a bunch of nuclear weapons and a bunch of cash. They have destabilized Syria. Assad wouldn't last five minutes. He's a puppet of Iran. The Houthis have destroyed Yemen. We've been kicked out of Yemen. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is second only to ISIL in terms of lethality to this nation. This civil war in Yemen has displaced us. We don't have any eyes and ears in Yemen anymore, and the Houthis have been supported by the Iranians. We're less safe. So at the end of the day, Lebanon, you got Hezbollah. So I don't see how Ben Rhodes or anybody else could believe that you would give these people money unless they change what they've been doing with the money they got. Why would you give them money hoping they would build roads when they're not building roads now? Let me stay on the, the, the nuclear deal and, and, and suggest to you the following, that the alternative to the deal is a spiral toward open military confrontation. If we don't sign a deal, if they don't come under an agreement where we have inspections, where they freeze most of their R&D, where they freeze their, their right. centrifuges from spinning, where they right. stop their centrifuges right. from spinning. Uh, aren't we looking at a situation in which they're a month or two from the nuclear threshold where it might come to pass that we have to attack them in order to stop them? And do you believe that an attack on Natanz, on Fordow, on all these facilities would actually stop them forever? Here's or it would, just, it would just provoke them to re redouble their efforts, no? Here's what I believe, that a bad deal would deny us any time, anywhere inspections, given the fact they lie and cheat. They've been dishonest about their nuclear program. If you don't have any time, anywhere inspections, including their military facilities, that's a terrible deal, given the history of the people you're dealing with. And when Wendy Sherman says, well, we wouldn't allow inspectors to come on our military bases, there's a moral equivalency between the United States and the Iranians. I reject that whole construct. So what would I do if I were president? I would say the following. If you want a peaceful nuclear power program, you can have it. The goal of the negotiations was to dismantle their nuclear program and try to create an environment for them to have nuclear power without a nuclear weapon. Do you remember that? The goal of the nuclear negotiations have changed dramatically. Now they're talking about build five more reactors. Here's what I would tell them. If you want a nuclear program for peaceful purposes, you can have it. If you want a small enrichment program to support a single reactor, I'm okay with that as long as we inspect it. But if you want a large enrichment program, you're not going to get it. If you want a war, you'll lose it. Now, how many people in here really think that the Iranians believe they would beat us in a war? The problem they've got, we've got, is they don't think we'll use military force to stop their nuclear ambitions. Until they believe that the United States is serious in stopping their nuclear ambitions, you'll never get a Explain good deal. Explain to me how, theoretically, the use of military force against Iran would stop them from achieving what they want to achieve. If what you, do you think they want to if achieve? If you walk away from these negotiations and you try to break out, we'll have a military conflict. It will be the policy of the Graham administration that if we can't negotiate a good deal to end your nuclear ambitions, we'll use military force to stop you from achieving your nuclear ambitions. And when I say military force, I mean military force. I mean going after your infrastructure, not only nuclearly, but your ability to wage war. The Iranians have to believe that their survival as a regime is at stake. I'm not talking about a land invasion. But you will never get a good deal with the Iranians if they believe the United States is not serious about using military force. If they walk away from this deal, we're in the most dangerous period in modern times. In 2003, did we invade the wrong country? In 2003, I, one, I don't miss Saddam Hussein at all. But if I know now, if I knew then what I know now, we wouldn't have had a land invasion, but would still be going after Saddam. Uh, Saddam was shooting at our airplanes who were inspecting flying under international law. He was denying weapons inspectors access to his uh, facilities and he was gassing the Kurds. So I'm glad he's gone. I'm not talking about invading Iran. I'm talking about stopping their nuclear capability from maturing. How many of you believe that's the biggest mistake America could make is to do a bad deal with Iran? That's a game changer. How many of you believe that they had a nuclear weapon, they may actually use it? 
they would share it with the terrorist organization at a minimum, that they really do want to wipe Israel off the map. Do you think they're joking? I don't think they're joking a damn bit. I think these guys are religious Nazis with an end of days view of their religion and they're dangerous as hell. And I think if you give them a nuclear capability, you'll regret it. Can I ask you, let me... This is nuts. There's something about you and... Um, and uh, Sorry. No, it's all right. It's all right. It's, we like enthusiasm at the Aspen well, Ideas Festival. Drawing that red line with a side was our biggest mistake. That's wait, let, wait, 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 wait. Let me ask you this, though. Let me play, continue to play devil's advocate here. Uh, drawing that red line resulted, it was a messy kind of formula, but it resulted in most of the chemical weapons leaving Syria and, wait, and, and Benjamin Netanyahu himself who is, you know, going to be your Secretary of Defense, it sounds like, uh, if you're President of the United States. Uh, I mean, I tell you what if, he'll be. He'll be my friend, <laughs> and he'll get invited to the White House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu himself said, Benjamin Netanyahu himself said, that it was a great blessing for Israel, that Israel could stop distributing gas masks to its citizens because President Obama engineered the removal of those chemical weapons from Syria. So that's, that's a guy on, you know, you're on that team, you know, and, and so, so what do you say to that, to the, to the argument that, 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 that the Syria plan, as messy as it was, kind of actually worked? I would say it was the biggest mistake probably Obama's made in telling a dictator if you do A, you'll pay a price. Well, he did A and he's still around. And everybody else who's watching how we behave toward dictators said, hey, we're all talk. Let, let, uh, let me finish yeah. my thought. I would you tell you this, that Assad is not going, Obama's going to go before Assad goes. I can tell you right now, Putin saw that as a sign of weakness. China saw it as a sign of weakness. The Iranians saw it as a sign of weakness. And if I get to be president, the first thing I'm going to do not the first. One of the first things is find out a way to tell Assad, hey, pal, you're going. What is the you're first You're going thing you're standing gonna do? up or you're going laying down, but you're going. What is the first thing you're going to do? The first thing I'm going to do depends on what's happening then. I don't know what's going to happen in 2017, but the first thing I will do as president is sit down and rebuild our military if it still hasn't been rebuilt. Keep, keep on Assad for a second. Um, because I you would said, make him go. No, no, but, but there's a very good chance... There's a very Do you think I would make him go? What? Do I think? Yeah. I'm asking the questions yeah, right now. Right. I don't think it's a question. I don't think it's a question because, A, I'm not 100% convinced that you're going to be president in 2017. Yeah, right. um, well, that just shows you how you don't yeah, see the big I'm picture. I'm short-sighted, yeah. obviously. I don't have a big picture. This is big ideas. <laughs> I lack ideas, obviously. The, um, I can't cast myself into the future that way. But I don't think that Assad is going to, I mean, and you hear this, obviously, you're hearing the same intelligence reports that, that Assad is losing territory pretty quickly, that he might be on the way out. And let me continue playing devil's advocate and, and, sure. and, and suggest this. At this point, the reality of the Middle East that is that, would you, that, that having Assad fall and having ISIS march into Damascus might not be, despite what you just said about the Revolutionary Guard Corps, having ISIS march into Damascus might be not terrible. be in the best interest of the United States of America. Do you think if I were president, they would march into Damascus? Again, I'm not answering your questions No, today. okay, well, let me tell you this. Can I tell you, and here are the big ideas. There's two things going on in the Middle East we need to get our hands around. There's a fight for the heart and soul of Islam. Does that make sense? There's a fight in the faith. The Christian religion had a reformation hundreds of years ago. There's a fight between a radical strain of Shia and Sunni religion and most people. And if we don't take sides, we're making a mistake. ISIL represents a form of religion no one can live with. There are plenty of people in the Mideast that we can live in peace with. And my job as President of the United States is to side with them. There's a second thing going on. Young people are not going to live in dictatorships for our convenience anymore. How many times have you heard that we would be better off Gaddafi in power and Saddam Hussein in power, that we'd be better off as a nation? I hear it all the time. Well, tell that to the people in uh, Libya and Iraq. To expect young people to live in a dictatorship for our convenience, that ship has sailed. You know all this stuff in your pocket that tells you what's going to happen every 15 seconds in the world? Young people in the Mideast, Jeff, have seen the other side of the mountain. They're never going back to living in a dictatorship for our convenience. 
I'm going to do two things. I'm going to side with people in the faith who will take the fight to these bastards, and I'm going to invest in young people. A small schoolhouse in a remote region educating a young girl will do more damage to radical Islam than a 500-pound bomb. And if I'm president of the United States, we're going to help these people. Let me, um, we're going back, and we're not leaving until we get it right. Let me, let me come to that, because that, 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 that is a, a, a statement that seems out of step, or some people would argue is out of step, with the current mood of the American electorate. The, one of the reasons that President Obama is not going into Syria in, in, in a more serious or concrete way is that there's no domestic pressure for more American involvement in internecine Middle East conflicts, right? So you and your, uh, 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 and, and, and John McCain and, and former Senator Lieberman, you are outliers right now in terms of your willingness or ability to, or, or, or belief that the American people would get behind more engagement in these sorts of terrible <clears throat> fights that we see in Iraq and Syria. So, I, and, and I want you to frame this in, 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 in the context of what you're trying to do now, okay. get the Republican nomination. Uh, how do you possibly see a way to the nomination when you have this kind of deep reluctance after Iraq, after so many years in Afghanistan, deep reluctance to, to insert ourselves into these problems? It's not their problem, it's our problem. ISIL is not a regional problem. It is a worldwide problem. Iran is not their problem, it is our problem. The American people are not where you say they are. They're 60% plus saying they're willing to send soldiers back over there to keep us safe over here. The American people are not stupid. The good thing about America is that we've never been a adventuresome nation. We've never wanted other people's stuff just to have other people's stuff. The world should be lucky because we could take a lot of people's stuff. We've been more good than bad. And here's what I think the American people respond to. I don't know how to defend us over here without some of our soldiers going back because the armies over there are failing miserably. I think there's a tie between the rise of ISIL in Syria and Iraq to homeland security threats here. I think it is essential that America stop the slaughter that when you crucify children, when you decimate an entire religion, and America does nothing about it, we always live to regret it. This is the 1930s all over again. And this ISIL threat is something that will come our way soon if we don't stop it over there. So here's my proposition. About 10,000 of us need to be in Iraq, not 3,500. We need a couple of aviation battalions with uh, attack helicopters. We need forward air controllers so we can drop bombs on the right targets. We need uh, American embedded at the battalion level to buck up the Iraqi army. And we need to turn the tide and to liberate Ramadi and Mosul are gonna be very tough operations, a city of a million people. The alternative of doing nothing is that the war continues, the King of Jordan's at risk. How many of you believe the Kingdom of Jordan's at risk from the war in Syria? Do you believe if we lost the King of Jordan, it would be a very bad day for us here at home? So I would tell the American people there's a price to be paid for intervening, and there's a cost for doing nothing. And I offer you bad options. Don't vote for me if you don't want to get back in the game over there, because I think we have to. I've been in the Air Force 33 years. I retired Wednesday of last week. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan about 30-something times. If I thought there was nobody to work with over there, I'd have a different belief. I've met the people up close and personal. They're more good than bad. I've seen many judges and military members get killed to only be replaced by others. So here's what I offer the American people. A strategy and a vision that would truly degrade and destroy ISIL because it's the right thing to do. You cannot win in Iraq unless you deal with Syria. Do you know how hard Syria will be? Syria is the safe haven for, for ISIL. You're going to need a very large army to go in on the ground in Syria to dislodge the caliphate. That army should come from Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the region as a whole. But if they're not about 10,000 of us in the mix, they could lose. The worst possible outcome is to take on these thugs and lose. Jeffrey, I don't know how to degrade and destroy ISIL unless we deal with Syria and we have a different capacity than we have today in Iraq. And if you don't hold the territory, what good have you been? Do the American people understand how much money is going to be 
required to repair Syria? It is a completely devastated country. The Arabs should pay most, but if we don't stay behind after the caliphate's destroyed, it will fall back into chaos. Can you convince the Alawites to live in peace with the Sunnis in Syria? I think you can. Can you put the Humpty Dumpty back together in Baghdad? I think you can. Here's the one thing I've learned. Partitioning Iraq is a fantasy. The Sunni Arabs in the region are not going to allow you to give southern Iraq to the Iranians. That's where most of the oil is at. The Kurdish independent state will throw Turkey into chaos and the region into chaos. There is no easy answer. I am talking about more troops at a time when most people are tired of hearing about the region. I'm talking about a sustained commitment that I think is required to achieve the goal of securing our nation. To degrade and destroy ISIL is going to take time, it's going to take effort. To change the region is a generational struggle. How do you change the region if you're not in the region? I'm going to bet on young people. If we had left Germany and Japan after a few years, only God knows what would have happened. This is a religious war. They would kill everybody in this room regardless of your ideology because you've not been to their faith. There is no substitute for winning this conflict. There is no substitute for America. We don't have the military we need. You asked me the first thing I would do is I would call the Congress back, get them up to Capitol Hill and say replace these defense cuts. We're going to have the smallest army since 1940, the smallest navy since 1915. This is insane given the threats we face. Please don't leave Aspen thinking that a Lindsey Graham presidency would be easy, but it would be successful. If you don't do Simpson Bowles, we become Greece. How many of you would like us to do something like Simpson Bowles? If I get to be your president, we're going to have a meeting, and I'm going to tell Republicans you have to do revenue, and I'm going to ask my Democratic friends to adjust the age of retirement because young people have to work longer. And I'm going to ask everybody in this room to give up some subsidies you now enjoy from Medicare and give up some of your Social Security benefits. And every one of you would say yes. 80 million baby boomers are going to retire in the next 20 years. We're going to wipe out Medicare and Social Security. We're going to become Greece in the process. We're going to be down to two workers for every retiree in the next 20 years. So when I hear a Republican say we need to cap legal immigration, what world are you looking at? Let me come to that. Let me come to that. Uh, look, uh, I'll say... Uh, and I'm sick of uh, self-deportation as the position of the Republican Party. Let me go to, let me go to immigration. Before we're going to go to questions in a, in a minute, um, I'll say this about you. Um, you, I can turn uh, one question into a lot of answers. Well, no, but that, anybody can do that. But, but, um, but your lack of euphemism is refreshing, uh, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, the, let, let's go to where you stand on some of these, uh, some of these more domestic-oriented issues, because this is where, on some of these defense issues, on some of these Middle East issues especially, you're not out necessarily of the mainstream of, of the Republican field. Rand Paul is the outlier. Uh, to, you, if you want to say something gratuitous about Rand Paul, this is your opportunity, by the way. He's a nice man and a great eye surgeon. And he's a great eye surgeon. <laughs> um, the, but on a set of issues, it's very hard to imagine your path to the Republican nomination, given that you believe that climate change is real and must be addressed. How many of you believe climate um, change is real? Uh, and, and given your if you don't mind the expression, liberal position on immigration. Uh, well, I do mind the expression, but keep talking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so ex ex explain to me on those issues where the Republican Party has moved and how you plan to yank back the party through winning this nomination. You know why I think climate change is real? Because I think it's real. I've been to Alaska. I've been to the Arctic Circle. I've been all over the world looking at this issue. When nine out of 10 climatologists tell you that CO2 emissions generated by man-made activity are creating greenhouse gas plant, uh, uh, greenhouse gas effect that traps heat and that's heating up the planet, when nine out of 10 tell you that, why should I believe the one? 
So if I went to 10 doctors and nine of them said, hey, you're going to die, and the other guy says, you're fine, <laughs> I think it would be odd to believe the one. <laughs> so I'm not a scientist. How many of you heard that? <laughs> well, hell, if you're not, ask the other scientists, people who are. Why don't you listen to them when they talk to you? So the issue should be the solution, not the problem. Why has the Republican Party moved away from science? I, I, don't, I think a lot of people believe that Al Gore turned this into a religion rather than a problem. Our friends on the left have oversold this. When John Kerry says the biggest threat to the world's climate change, I respectfully disagree. So there's a lot of overselling on the other side. But I can't answer that question other than say that I know where Lindsey Graham's at. Lindsey Graham believes that if half of this stuff is right, it's bad news. That it's a national security problem in the making. As the oceans rise and as food gets to be less plentiful, as the land gets more arid, as the effects of climate change begin to visit us on a global level, you have a very destabilized world. So why not make it a business-friendly endeavor? Why not take the environmental community as not completely crazy? and join with the people who are in the energy business who are looking for a way to make a profit but understand that lower carbon is probably the way to go and see if you can create a, an emission standard that's better for business. See if you can incentivize alternative energy and find all the above approach to fossil fuels. To me, that's what the next president needs to do. Stay on the presidential race one immigration. more minute. Immigration. Yeah. Yeah, do, do immigration very quickly, but I also want to ask you about the people that we believe to be at this moment the front runners of the Republican nomination. Um, so go to immigration and then tell me why you think Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Scott Walker can't beat win in a general election. Well, I, I think they can. I think this is our election to lose, really. And we have the ability to lose it. Uh, so <laughs> if it weren't for the Democratic Party, we'd be screwed to begin with. Uh, so there's a reason that it's hard to win the White House three times in a row. President Obama had a good week last week, but it's not a substitute for good policies. Things that happened last week, we need to celebrate in some ways and understand that change is afoot. The bottom line is that I really believe that Hillary is going to inherit a presidency that people are a little tired of. John McCain was running into Bush headwinds. Did that make sense? There's fatigue out there. I think in September of 2016, Pre people's premiums are going to be a lot higher today for health care because of Obamacare. A lot of employers are going to drop coverage. How do they beat us demographically? Any Republicans in the room? <laughs> hey, meet me in the corner. Uh, 2012 was a demographic race. Mitt Romney is one of the most decent people I've ever met. He said, much to his credit, his biggest mistake was adopting self-deportation. We had too many debates, and he got pushed too far to the right. How do you win the White House with 27% of the Hispanic vote? I really do believe that Hispanics and other minorities are going to be looking for something different and new. Immigration is the primary reason, the debate, in my mind, how we've gone from 44 to 27. If you don't believe that, then you're not listening to our Hispanics brothers and sisters. Self-deportation means the following. Since 1986, millions of people have been coming here legally, mostly to work. We have two borders, the Mexican border and the Canadian border, right? I've never met an illegal Canadian. <laughs> they come to Myrtle Beach, go swimming and march and go home. We're glad they do, because it's too cold for us. Most people, most people here illegally are here to work. Do you agree? They come from poor and corrupt countries. A young woman comes in the late 80s with one child, and she has two more. She's been cleaning our toilets. She's been servicing our hotels. She's been working four jobs to raise three kids. Two of them are American citizens because they were born here. One of the three is now a Marine on his second tour in Afghanistan. He comes back home and he says, where's mom? You haven't heard? She's walking back to Mexico. Self-deportation means that you drive them out. Self-deportation means that you break up families. Nobody wants a felon to stay. Nobody wants a troublemaker. 
but most of the people here have been working very hard, and I'll give them a chance to get right with the law. And the reason I want a pathway to citizenship is I don't like the underclass approach to America. I don't like the hired help approach that Europe has, where you come to a European country, you live there all your life, but you can't be part of that country. If I'm president of the United States, we'll have a challenging pathway forward to citizenship, but I would not sign a bill unless it allowed people who we agree as a group to stay here all their lives unless one day they could be part of us. I'm looking for assimilation too. So from an immigration point of view, if we continue to push an unrealistic solution to immigration, we're not gonna be able to get that second look that is there for us to have. We've moved. Self-deportation is in our rear view mirror. But there are people running for president on the Republican side who've said some very mean things that are continuing a narrative that is killing us. When I was 21, my mom died. When I was 22, my dad died. Neither one of my parents finished high school. We owned a liquor store, a bar, and a pool room. That's why I'm well qualified to be president. <laughs> uh, my family was destroyed by illness. I will not destroy families just for the hell of it. And that's what self-deportation means. One more. Go to the field. Go to the people we believe are the leaders of the field and tell us very specifically why you are a better candidate for president than those people. I just think and I'm a better candidate to be commander in chief. Jeb Bush is a wonderful guy. If he's the nominee, I'll support him. I think he could be a good president if he got to be president. But I need to be running for me. I don't think anybody, quite frankly, understands what has happened in the Mideast better than I do. I think our friends would love for me to be president, including the Arabs, because they understand with Lindsay, you know what you're getting here. And I would tell the Arabs, you want to go in to get Assad, so do I. We're going to get ISIL together, but here's the price of admission. Stop funding terrorism. Stop double betting here. If you do it, you're on the wrong side of me. And let women drive, by the way. <laughs> so, I just think I can do things in the region nobody else can do. I think I would be a good president to make something like Simpson Bowles happen because I've stretched myself as a senator. The best indication of what kind of president you're going to be is what kind of whatever you've been. I have tried to do things that are tough, but somebody better do. If we don't fix immigration, do you agree that we can't have the workforce we need going forward? We just don't have enough people in the country. And why pick people next door? Pick them from all over the world. Don't you agree if you don't do something like Simpson Bowles, our economy is destroyed. By 2031, all the money collected in taxes, and thank you for what you've sent, <laughs> goes to pay the interest on the debt, Medicare and Medicaid, and Social Security. There'll be no money for anything else unless some president sometime, somewhere, can get the parties to move. I think I can do that better than anybody or I wouldn't be running. Uh, I want to go to questions. If you put your hand up, um, there's a question right here and there's mics coming around and there's a guy enthusiastic. Oh, you asked the question this morning. You're too enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I want these questions short and to the point, yeah, please. Thank I'm sorry, you. I've talked too much. Senator no, 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 Graham, right I'm, Arn I'm Arn Manconi. I'll ask you the same question I asked former Ambassador to Afghanistan, Carl Eckenberg. Yeah. Okay, uh, for for Assad, ISIS is an asset. Saudi Arabia is more threatened by Houthis than ISIS. Turkey uses ISIS to keep the PKK at bay. As John Stewart said, we're finally in a proxy war against ourselves. We've just seen 14 years of a trillion dollars and one and a half million people killed in the Middle East. If you took us into war with Iran, what would it cost in lives and what would it cost in taxpayer dollars? Well, number one, I wouldn't want to take you into war with Iran, but I wouldn't let Iran get a nuclear weapon because that would cost more than any number you could imagine, and it would set in motion the worst possible outcome for our nation. So the choices are pretty bad right here. What I would try to do is find a way to stop the nuclear ambitions of Iran without a war, but if they want a war, they choose it, not us, and they'll lose it. So don't look to me 
as a guy that's going to overly worry about going to war with Iran if they insist upon it. They need to be worried about going to war with us. Listen, I don't want a war with anybody. I've seen what it's like, very close and up personal. It's a horrible, terrible thing, but the worst possible thing is to be afraid to fight for your values when they're at stake. If we could go back into the 30s, would we have changed our approach to Hitler? I am telling you right now, if the Iranians develop a nuclear capability, it's going to throw their region into a nuclear arms race, and there's no price tag you can put on that. So I want the Iranians to know that whatever it takes, as long as it takes, is my policy against radical Islam. You know what my policy is? Protecting you, your family, and our way of life against radical Islam. Whatever it takes, as long as it takes. That's my policy. Whatever it costs, as long as it costs. That enthusiastic guy. Hi, uh, uh, I'm a Democrat. I've always viewed you as a really as a very intelligent, eloquent Republican. I want to ask you a question. Keep that to yourself. <laughs> I, exactly. Right. I'll, I'll deny it if I need to. I want to ask a question that's a little more long-term than your presidential ambitions or even like the events of the day. Um, when I grew up on the on the other side, we had William F. Buckley. God help me, Newt Gingrich. The Republican Party was filled with a lot of intelligent people who truth, logic, and context, they, they observed it, they were fair adversaries. My, my question is basically, do you agree that more than the Democrats, the Republican Party has eschewed logic, truth, context on things like climate change? And um, if so, shouldn't, what, what can we do about the fact that one of the major parties in this country, according to people like me, don't observe the rules of logic and truth and things like that. And, and is that going to change? No offense, but well, that's apparently the truth. you've never met Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. I love Bernie. How many of you believe Bernie is a good man? How many of you believe he's a socialist? Just ask Bernie. If you want a socialist, vote for Bernie. If you want the third term of Barack Obama, vote for Hillary. The point you make about our party is, yes, we have some problems in our party. Jeb Bush, I think, is a very good man. I think we got a lot of talented people, and we got some people on our side who are just kind of nuts. You got people on your side kind of nuts. I work with them. <laughs> so how do you get $18 trillion in debt? Bipartisanship. How do you get out of debt? Bipartisanship. How do you fix immigration? Bipartisanship. How do you save Medicare and Social Security? Bipartisanship. Trust me, if I asked Bernie to adjust the age of retirement, he would go crazy. Bernie believes that just taxing you a little bit more will save the problems that Medicare and Social Security face. We got people on our side who believe all you need to do is build a fence. There you go. We have a question back there. Can you get the mic? Thank you. Uh, I'm also a Democrat, and it is refreshing to hear that there are intelligent Republicans out there. <laughs> but, but the question I have is, with all due respects, on what planet are you living on to think that you'd be able to get the Republican nomination? You have no idea about the Republican Party. 65% of Republicans support a comprehensive approach to immigration. What state do I come from? South Carolina. I had six opponents, from mildly disturbed to completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I won by 41 points. Don't tell me about my party. I come from the reddest of red states. I won being Lindsey Graham. I didn't work around immigration and say, well, I'm not really for it, but I am for it. I told people you can't fix it without democratic support. If you don't control who gets a job, it doesn't matter how high you build a fence. And 11 million people ain't going to walk back to Mexico. Keep them here, make them learn our language, pay taxes, and get in the back of the line. Listen, my party is not crazy any more than the Democratic Party is crazy. But I can tell you, make a good case that all of us are crazy. Because we're not doing the hard things, right? How could you write the Constitution today? Wouldn't that be fun, Walter, to have a Saturday Night Live skit with a bunch of satellite trucks around Philadelphia Hall, and every time you came out, somebody putting a mic in your face? You know what's hard? Citizens United, unlimited giving by undisclosed people. That's going to be a problem for us what did, all. What did you mean when you said that 50 people are controlling democracy now? I mean that if you're running... It sounded for, a little conspiratorial. Well, it's not they're controlling. Democracy is that if you want to be relevant, you've got to have a supportive super PAC. Do you all agree with that? Supportive super PACs are, are, are a necessary component to being competitive. Jeb raised $100 million for a super PAC and probably hadn't raised 20, you know, maybe $5 million for his campaign. Citizens United, I don't know how to fix it, but it's a problem. 
is going to eat away at our democracy. And here's, here's what I think. Here's what I think about this national polling test to get into the Republican primary. That's nuts. You undercut Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. If it were based on name ID and national polling, Brad Pitt would get in our primary. <laughs> so the bottom line is this effort to nationalize the Republican primary is a mistake. You reward people who have run before from big states. I like the idea I have to go to Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, be checked out before I can get the nomination. You know why Bernie is doing pretty well? Because he's showing up. And he's talking openly about what he believes, and there's a market for it. Do you think Hillary would be a good president? I think she could be a good president, but I think at the end of the day, she hasn't demonstrated to me a willingness to tell Bernie you're full of crap. <laughs> now, I've told people on my side, we're not going to just secure the border. The darkest days in America wasn't the case last week. How about 9-11 in Pearl Harbor? I think that beats what the court did. There's somebody else. I saw a hand, but I can't. But I don't see her pushing back. The, um, Where's she on the Iranian deal? Well, let me ask you this <laughs> while, I, while I find that first one. I can't see with the lights. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about American exceptionalism, this idea. Uh, Hillary Clinton, to me, stands for a more traditional understanding of American exceptionalism. We beat the Nazis. We beat the communists. Uh, we're the indispensable nation. Barack Obama. Uh, has, there's been interesting stories written about this, has the idea that, that, that what makes America exceptional is our ability to self-correct. Um, maybe this is a natural outgrowth of his background and what he's seen. Um, where do you come down on this indispensability and exceptionalism issue, and where do you place Hillary on that, on that spectrum? Well, everybody... You worked very closely with her, so it's, it's not almost, just talking out... Right, no, yeah. right. Uh, everybody on the planet is a little bit to the right of, of, of President Obama on this kind of question. I think he sees Bush as a bigger problem than the Iranians. I think he saw Bush as some kind of cowboy that just opened up the hornet's nest. Bush made his fair share of mistakes, but I guess what I would say is that there's no substitute in the fight of good versus evil for the United States. Maybe simplistic, but I think we're living in very difficult times where evil is roaming the planet pretty much unchecked right now, and President Obama doesn't understand that this is a generational struggle. He says it, but he doesn't understand it. He says he wants to degrade and destroy ISIL because he knows that's the right goal, but he doesn't understand what it takes to get there. He's haunted by his political promises. In many ways, we're haunted by the Iraq war when it comes to what to do today in Iraq and Syria. I have to ask you this. I think hey, Hillary would be more mainstream than that. I have to ask you this. Why is ISIS our problem? Okay. I mean, you know, and, and, and the flip side of that question is, is do you think that there's a role for China sure. in international governance sure. and taking on some of the roles that and you, Russia you, too. You, you, have, you have laid out for us China so many roles for yeah. American diplomats and soldiers sure. in a Lindsey Graham sure. administration. Why sure. is this all our problem? Well, at the end of the day, uh, Iran could be affected more by China and Russia than us, but I don't see them doing a whole lot. I don't see Russia helping the world move forward. They're affected by radical Islamic terrorism as much as we are. But do you think Russia's playing a constructive role in the world right now? Do you think China's uh, infringing on resource-rich waters claimed by others is a helpful thing? I don't see Iran and, um, excuse me, China and Russia helping. I wish they would. At the end of the day, wishing is not a foreign policy. At the end of the day, I think Russia and China change their behavior only when we change ours. I think the best thing we could do for the Ukraine is give them some weapons to defend their homeland against a Russian-backed invasion. If they die, they die fighting. Wouldn't weapons to the Ukraine provoke <laughs> Putin to totally annihilate the Ukrainian army? Who would want to provoke army? Putin? At the end of the day, we signed an agreement with the Ukrainians in the 90s. If you give up your nuclear arsenal, we will guarantee your sovereignty. Putin stepped all over that. How many countries did Hitler have to go in before somebody said, hey, maybe we got the wrong construct here? Here's what I'm saying about Putin. He has stepped all over the agreement that he signed and we signed, and he's put the world in a state of disorder. I would ship as much natural gas as I could get my hands on to Eastern European countries to help them break the monopoly Putin has over them. 
I don't want a war with Russia, but I'd help the Ukrainians fight their own war. I would be, rebuild NATO. I would say to the five countries who are spending 2% of GDP, thanks a bunch. To the rest of you, up your game because we're going to up ours. I would reinforce NATO so that every time Putin looked around, he'd see a NATO flag. If we don't do these things, it gets worse. As to China, I want to trade with you, but if you keep taking property that doesn't belong to you by force, uh, the threat of force of arms, we're going to have a different trading relations. If you keep hacking into our systems and cyber attacking our nation, we're going to treat you not, not as a friend, but as an adversary. You choose what kind of relationship you want. If you want to be a, a friend, the doormat's open. If you want to fight, then we're going to fight. I don't want to fight. I don't want to be walked all over. You ask me what kind of role America plays? We're the only force to stop some of this stuff before it gets out of hand. You ask me how much would it cost and what would I do? Whatever it takes to stop radical Islam from getting a weapon of mass destruction. How many of you think the only reason 3,000 of us died on 9-11 and not 3 million is because they couldn't get the weapon to kill 3 million of us? If they could, would they use it? If you give it to the Iranians, it's going to work their way into the hands of people who actually use it. I believe that. And I'm telling people things that are uncomfortable. But if I didn't believe it, I shouldn't be running because I really think, Jeffrey, that world is sinking into a level of chaos that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And it's never going to turn around until America changes her foreign policy. And her foreign policy should be a clenched fist and an open hand. Let me let me conclude. Let me let me conclude where let me conclude where we started in South Carolina. No, on on the issue of race. Yeah. Uh, obviously, most of the time we spend talking, we spend yeah. talking about foreign affairs. But this is a question that that is one of the most mysterious questions in in American politics in some way. Uh, the party of Lincoln has a terrible time convincing African Americans that it's their friend. Um, you spoke eloquently at the beginning about the way South Carolina is changing. What can you do to convince African Americans that the Republican Party, which they believe for the past, in, in large numbers have believed for the last 40 years, is not their friend? How do you change that, that fundamental fact of American politics? Well, I got 6% of the vote in my last election uh, in a general election, so I'm not here to, to lecture the Republican Party. I consider that a failure on my part. Uh, Here's what I would tell the African-American community and everybody else that, unfortunately, your kids go to the worst schools in the country more than anybody else's kids. Help me find a way to stop that, and I will. Jamal doesn't get invited back for the job interview. Let's find a way to make sure that, it, that he's prepared for the job interview and he gets invited back. Um, what we're doing ain't working. It's not working for any of us. We're all failing together, and I'd like us all to succeed together. Um, the Southern strategy by Nixon, where we tried to peel off the white vote from the Democratic Party worked, and the white Southern Democrat became a Republican. And some of the things we did to get the white Southern Democrat we're paying a price for now with the African American community. When you ask about issues, there's a lot of alignment with Republican values when you talk about the party brand. There's not much of an appetite for it. Me and any of you in business, we got a branding problem. And I would do my best to try to say to the American people, including African Americans, if I'm president, I'm president for all of us. I'll try my best to be fair. If you're looking for a liberal, I'm not your choice. If you're looking for a conservative who understands we're all in it together, I'm your best bet. Thank you, Senator. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it.